Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'll simply say it is an honor. I was told no accolades. I stand here today representing four women, none of them alive today, but through what you see standing here. I deliberately have not come with any props or PowerPoints or fancy presentations. This is as high as the technology gets. <laughs> and when I thought about it, I thought actually it is appropriate. Where I come from, in the eastern province of Zambia, we pass on wisdom, we pass on lessons learned. We lead through storytelling. And that storytelling came to me through two women, my grandmothers, maternal and paternal. And I say to them, to myself, PowerPoint would not be appropriate because those stories were told to us outside the village hut, in the dark, with only the stars and the moon, and when it was rainy season, sometimes you did not even have any stars, but there was always a log, a fire, that drew you into the story. My grandmother, particularly my paternal grandmother, after whom I'm named, was very good at this. And she would always start the story as the orator. Panali. There's some Zambians in the room. There's some Zambians from the eastern province in the room. Panali, loosely translated, is once upon a time. And we, her grandchildren, my siblings, my cousins, would hang on to this orator who was looking into the fire like she knew everything in the whole world. And our response would be, Tiritonse. Tiritonse in my language means, we are together. We are one. We are cohesive. You have our attention. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope for the next 15 minutes, Tiritonse. This is my story. And I'm looking at this bike that somebody referred to and said, I hope next time we have a Ferrari. I rather like this. I tell you why I like it. This is my history. This is my mother's history. I've been looking at this bike and thinking to myself, when my mother was taken from her village at 16 or 17 to go and marry my father, whom she had not met, she must have traveled on something that looked like this. And so for me, there are three lessons in life, and all of what I say is going to revolve around these three lessons that I have learned over the years. One is a reverence for history. We keep asking ourselves as Africans, why are we not learning? Why are we not changing? I think we do read history, we do hear history, but I'm not sure that we revere where we come from. I think when you revere where you come from, a lot of the things that we see going on in Africa today, we would not see. And by that I mean the negative things. So one for me is a reverence for history. So the four women I want to recognize today are my two grandmothers, as I mentioned. The one for telling me her stories and giving me wisdom and leading me until now she is with me. The second for saying to me in a very early part of my career, I used to be on television, I used to do a business program in Zambia, and my grandmother would always watch this program. And she would be very frustrated. It was a debate when others started talking, and in her language she would say, why is this man interfering? Why can't he give my little girl a chance? And one day, I, I, I drove to Chipata when my father told me, you know, I was with your grandmother, and this is what she was saying. And I went to ask her, and I said, but Granny, you don't understand what we're talking. She said, no, but just explain one thing to me. This word that you all keep talking about, potential, potential. potential. Is it edible? Can I eat it? <laughs> it was a very telling moment for me, and it's what we're talking about today. Africa rising, and yet there's so much of Africa that is not rising. It's dropping. So we do these words, we speak them in audiences, we're in rooms like this, we cogitate, we intellectualize, but it doesn't go below this. So in this discussion for me about moving forward, there is something I really want to share at the end of the day, and that is that this should be a national anthem. 
It should not be individuals who sit in audiences and share ideas. This has got to come from the bottom up. People have got to have hope. So that's, that's the reverence for history for me. There are two women who changed my life. My real mother, biological, uneducated in the conventional way, so did not speak English, did not go to school, but the wisest woman I ever knew. The second is my aunt, my Auntie Hope, who I call my mother to this day. I love that woman to bits. Let me tell you why. When I was 10, my world was shattered. My world and my siblings. My father died in a car accident, tragic. He was 42, left no will. My mother was 36 and she had six of us. Did not work. Here begins the story of the African man dies and leaves the, the family and the children devastated. Lifestyle completely changed. It was as if our cohesive family, the whole, had been drawn into a center of a tornado and in a split second been thrown in a totally different environment, not whole anymore, fragmented. My siblings and I were parceled off to various family members. Some of us landed on fertile ground, others less lush. The aunt story, the uncle story, the in-law story. Um, I landed on very fertile ground. To this day, I have a man and a woman whom I call my father and my mother, even though both my parents are gone. They have been there for me since I was 10. My miseries, my lives, everything. This to say there are good people in this world. And everyone in this room, if there is one thing I can ask you to take away, when you see a child in adversity, when you see an adult in adversity, it is not of their asking. Reach out and see them through. A word can make a world of a difference. We, we, we sometimes have these invisible people around us, whether they are orphans or workers or relatives from the village. They are people. They have needs. They are part of what is going to move Africa forward. We are privileged to be in this position. We are privileged to be in this position. And leadership for me, and I consider myself a leader because I am ahead of the rest of the pack in my family, amongst others, it's, it's, it's a lonely place, but it is an anointed place. You have a responsibility. We have a responsibility. The second lesson I have learned in life, so the reverence for history is one. The second one is that some have talked about it as vision, others have used other words, my view is, yes, you have a vision, you have a goal, but you have to set a standard. So Ali talked about, are we content that 8% growth in China is a depression, but 6% growth in Africa is Africa rising? No, we shouldn't be content. That is not a standard that I want for Africa. It is far below where we could be, which is far below where we should be if we're going to change lives. And so for me, setting standards and living by example, you will be amazed how many people watch us. I know when I go home, I now live at home, but my cousins in the village, I always go dressed like this. <laughs> Why? Because I want them to know that they can be like this. My brother and I have a constant argument when we're going to the village about, you can't go all dressed up, take off your jewelry. And I say, no, they need to know. There is a different life. You don't need to settle. So standards for me, and living by those standards is very important. I think the third point that has seen me through life is conviction and courage. When you have decided you're going to go a different path, and everybody in this room, by virtue of being here, by virtue of having parted with your 100 pounds, having parted with your last Saturday, that's likely to be a sunny day in London for the next four months, <laughs> you are you have courage, but you, are also con you have conviction about something that you need to do. It may not have crystallized, but it surely will. So that courage and conviction is what really sees you through some rough times. In the corporate world, I've done well, but there have been rough times. But I have had to keep moving forward. I don't have the luxury of choosing east or west. The only choice I have is moving forward. We are first generation well-to-do in my family. I have cousins from my mother's side of the family, from my father's side of the family, that if I put a picture of you, of myself and them next to each other, none of you would believe that this was my relative. 
because they have just not been given the opportunity. I cannot waste that opportunity. Hence my decision in 2012, after 16 years with the IFC in Washington, D.C., very cushy, looking at retirement in Florida in a pink house on the beach, I decided it is time. It is time for you to take, as another speaker said, what is in your hands and go home. We also had talk about home. How do I define home? It is where I feel complete. And Zambia and Africa is where I feel complete. Where I move from Zambia, where I'm eating in Simba, to Lagos, somebody gives me fufu, to Kenya, somebody says to Kumawiki, this is me. This is Africa. And I could not, I could not with any conscience sit anymore in Washington, D.C. and continue a content and a fulfilled life. Hence my decision to leave and go back to Zambia. CDC, somebody mentioned CDC. You may be asking your yourselves, but you left and you're in London, so where exactly does the village fit in? Um, it just came as a by the by. It's a contract that ends at the end of this year. I stepped in for a very needy uh, situation and uh, I go back to, to Zambia and Johannesburg. I do need the luxuries of life from time to time. <laughs> <laughs> I need to keep a foot in both. But um, in the last few minutes, I'd just like to say what TEDx has done for me. It's the first time I'm attending. I was a little bit, it was, I think, April when, when I was asked. I said, yes, it seems like a very far away thing. I might be dead by that time, who knows? I may not have to fulfill this responsibility and stand in front of 650 people um, and try to inspire and try to give a message. Um, and then as it got closer and I saw the theme, I said, well, this is a great responsibility, Dolika. You really have to step up, Ms. Banda. But as I started to think through, I said, so I've left Washington, D.C. I'm fairly comfortable. I'm living between these two cities. I'm healthy. I'm able to continue. What am I going to do? I was in that period after 16, actually after 20 years of working in the corporate world where my brain was frazzled, to use a common word. Uh, and I couldn't really think clearly. TEDx, you've made me think clearly. It's crystallizing what it is that I need to do. And that crystallization is telling me that there are so many, and I was counting late last night, um, over 200 individuals, some in Zambia, some in Kenya, some in Germany, some in Sweden, some in Guatemala. I traveled a lot when I was with IFC. That call me Auntie D. They call me Sistolica. They call me Mama Dolls. And you suddenly realize people are looking up to you. People are looking up to you. And are you giving them the time of day? Or are you saying, here it comes again. I'm on my way to the airport. And people just wanted time. My, ne my nieces, my nephews, my parents, some of them living, when I say parents, it's all encompassing. Um, my friends who look to you and say, you've had a different life. How did you do it? And so for me, living here today, is to say, Zambia, I'm on my way. I don't know what this next chapter is going to look like, but I do know it's going to have something to do with uplifting people, inspiring people, if it is through my word. <laughs> there is somebody in this room I know for a fact that he is here, whom I've only known for a year. A young man, young African man, and he calls me our fearless leader. And wherever you are, Seto, I know you're in the audience, you don't know what that means to me. You don't know when you first made that statement what it meant to me. It, it, it meant to me that, Dolika, there's a whole generation behind you. They don't call you Mama Dolls for nothing. You don't have gray hairs for nothing. <laughs> you don't have wisdom for nothing. So it is my time to tell this story. I now need to step back into the shoes of my grandmothers, and it is my time to share, to encourage, to convey, to tell people, you can do this. Africa, we can do this. Zambia, we can do this. Kenya, you can do this. Togo, you can do this. It's possible. It's not possible. It's possible.
There are moments, to many, my life is a success. I don't know what that means. To me, I'm an achiever. I, I have overcome certain things, so I'm a survivor. I don't know what success means. It's a very relative description. Somebody, for, me, for, for one person, a million is successful. For another person, 10 million is successful. Um, during those years, just after my father died, I always told myself I would never be poor and I would be rich. <laughs> I don't know whether that's happened, but I'm not too shabbily off, so I think I've done pretty well. <laughs> So what I want to say is when those bad moments come, draw into yourself and go into your anchors. Every one of us has to have an anchor. My anchors are my family and my friends, not in any order of importance. The children around me, family, non-family, biological, non-biological, who look to us and then they, you inspire them, but they inspire you to continue walking, to continue marching forward, and my God. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope I have inspired.